we're going to see that uh, not just up in heaven, but down here below, there are things that are far more precious than gold, far more precious than anything we value that are available to us, not just when we get to heaven, but right here and now. Because it says in our passage for today that his riches are available to all who call on him. That's in Romans chapter 10, if you'll turn there. Romans 10, and today we will be starting today we will, uh, in verse 6. We're going to turn today from what we called last week the tyranny of works righteousness that we kind of unpacked last time to really the simplicity of faith righteousness, which is more precious than gold. Last week we looked at the tyranny, really, of the uh, self-made identity, or what Paul called works righteousness. We saw that it's a pattern of thinking where you feel like it's all up to you. One that we fall back into over and again once we're saved. In stark contrast to what we're going to be looking at this week, and that is the simplicity, really the liberty of what Paul calls the righteousness that comes by faith, where all you have to do is call, as I've titled this message, Winter, Spring, Summer, or Fall. Remember James Taylor's song back in the 60s, You Got a Friend? I believe it was so popular because it taps into a fundamental need that is in the heart and soul of every man, woman, and child that's made in the image of God, one that only Christ can satisfy. When you're down and troubled and you need a helping hand and nothing, whoa, nothing is going right, close your eyes and think of me and soon I will be there to brighten up even your darkest nights. You just call out my name. And you know wherever I am, I'll come running to see you again. If the sky above you should turn dark and full of clouds and that old north wind should begin to blow, keep your head together and call my name out loud. And soon I'll be knocking upon your door. You just call out my name and you know wherever I am, I'll come running to see you again. And then the chorus, winter, spring, summer, or fall. All you've got to do is call, and I'll be there. Yes, I will. You've got a friend. That's one of the most famous songs, obviously, of, from the 60s. Today we come to one of the most famous lines in all of Scripture, which teaches exactly that, believe it or not, about the Lord God Almighty. Romans 10, 6, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He'll be there to make sure that happens. We're going to see today that this is the secret key to unlocking any predicament, any problem in life. And best of all, it's how we are saved, not only from the penalty of sin, it's how we are saved from the power of sin. It's how we go from righteousness imputed, as the theologians say, to righteousness imparted, from justification to sanctification, where not only does he reckon us righteous, he makes us righteous as we call on him. It's in Romans 10, starting in verse 6. And I thought I'd read it from the New Living Translation, so just sit back and listen, and then we will unpack it. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. You don't need to go to heaven to find Christ and bring him down to help you. And it says, you don't need to go to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. Salvation comes from trusting Christ, which is the message we preach. It's already within easy reach. In fact, the scriptures say the word is close at hand. It is in your lips and in your heart. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For by believing in your heart, for believing in your heart results in righteousness. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who believes in him will not be disappointed. Jew and Greek and Gentile are the same in this respect. 
They all have the same Lord who generously gives his riches to all who ask for them. For anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This passage is, is about both coming to faith and living by faith. And both will happen by calling on the name of the Lord. And it divides into two simple parts. First is God's stimulus, and then second is our response. First, God's stimulus, which is the word of Christ. And it starts in verse 6. The righteousness based on faith says, you don't need to go up to heaven to find Christ and bring him down to help you. And it says, you don't need to go to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. What he's saying here is this. You, you don't need to do really anything. You don't need to, to do any great feats or small feats. You don't need to impress me to perform heavenly feats of spirituality or health, hellish depths of self-sacrifice. You don't have to ascend to heaven or to descend into hell like Christ did to become the person that I want you to be or to find me so I can help you. No, rather, next verse, verse 8, the scripture says the, lo the word is close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. Who will bring Christ down? Who will bring him up? Who will bring him near to save us? That's the question. The answer to that question is this. He's already near you and available to you whenever you hear his word. The same word that, cre you know, that created the world is here to recreate us. Because, you see, all that he can do for us, all he wants us to do, comes to us through his word to us. That's God's stimulus. The word is close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. That's why that's our number one value as a church. Our first legacy value, as we call it, uh, as a church, is the Word of God. It reads like this. We prize the Word of God from the pulpit to, the small, to small groups to the prayer closet. We seek a rich grounding in God's Word. We endeavor to brighten a dark region as li a lighthouse for truth and as a greenhouse for growth. It's not the will of man, but the word of God, from the pulpit to the prayer closet to small groups, that turns the church into a greenhouse for growth. Because it's through God's word that all, you know, that he wants us to be, it's like it comes to us, he hands it to us on a silver platter. Because far from being able to ascend or to descend by some great feat of spirituality, according to Paul, we can't even get out of the door of our flesh. According to Romans 7, according to Romans 1 to 3. The most we can do is open the door and receive something that he's laid right at the door, and even that is by his power. The most we can do is open our mouth and confess something that he's put right on the lip of our tongue, and even that's by his power. We need that degree of help or we're lost. That's the undergirding assumption here, which leads us to how it works out in practice. We actually just read about it. Let's pick it up again in verse 9. The word is close at hand. It's on your lips and in your heart. For if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What he's saying is you just, you just confess that he's your savior, not yourself, because you've believed that God raised him from the dead to be your savior. If you just do that, you will be saved. And then he goes on to tell us that he's talking about being saved, not just from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin, which is what we really need to remind ourselves of as Christians. It's in the next verse. Verse 10, for with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Now, the literal translation here is, with the heart man believes to or toward righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses to or toward salvation. The word in the Greek is 
uh, ace, which literally translates again toward, as in moving in a direction. It connotes not a point in time, but a process. The idea being, we have not arrived once we've become Christians. That's just the point in time that begins the process. No, we are going toward righteousness and toward salvation because it's a lifelong process. It's like the old saying goes, we're saved in three different ways. We're saved from the penalty of sin when we're justified and from the power of sin we're saved as we're sanctified and one day we'll be saved from the very presence of sin when we'll be glorified. Salvation is a process according to scripture. And righteousness is a process too. It's imputed as we say when we're justified. That is, he gives us the righteousness of Christ. That's how he views us as being righteous in Christ. But righteousness is not just imputed. It's actually imparted. It's imparted uh, where we're, as more and more we're sanctified, as more and more he makes us actually righteous. God reckons it unto us when we first believe, but he, re- you know, he releases it unto us the more we believe. Because with the heart man believes ace toward righteousness, process. And with the mouth he confesses toward righteousness. Salvation. So the question is this. Is what he asked the Galatians. At least it's the question for Christians. When he said, O foolish Galatians, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? Having begun by faith, by the power of the Spirit to save you, are you now being perfected in the flesh, without faith, without the power of the Spirit? They're both supposed to be the same. You gave him control of your life when you believed that only he could make you right with God. Only he could make you righteous before God. So, who's doing it now? You believed for righteousness way back when, and sure enough, he imputed it. But are you believing him toward righteousness now so he can actually impart it? You believe him for salvation from the penalty of sin, but are you believing him toward salvation from the power of sin? As your fundamental posture when it comes to growing in Christ. You believed him for justification, but are you now believing him toward sanctification? This verse calls us back to the, the overarching theme of the book of Romans. Romans 1.16 where he sets this as a banner over the book, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God toward, for, the same word, ace, the power of God toward salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also from to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, which means it's by faith from first to last for both justification and, and sanctification in the faith walk. By the simplicity of faith righteousness versus the tyranny of works righteousness. The Christian life is by faith, and we're going to make this practical in a bit, but we've got to get the theology right. It is by faith from beginning to end. As it is written, Paul continues, the righteous shall live by faith. Or as Paul said to the Galatians, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because the fact is that we are as desperately dependent on the power of the gospel as Christians as we were before we became Christians. We are still sinners uh, who were saved from the penalty of sin by grace and who continue to be saved from the presence of sin, to be sanctified by grace alone through faith. And there is not a man, woman, or child on the face of the earth who gains their righteousness when coming to Christ except by faith. And there is not a man, woman, or child on the face of this earth who grows in righteousness except by faith. Because it's by God or from God, by faith, from first to last which is just what we see, again, that's the overarching theme of the book, 
in our passage for today as we continue unpacking it, Romans 10, verse 10. Again, for the, with the heart man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses to salvation, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him in this way will not be disappointed. Unfortunately, there are a lot of disappointed people who are trying to walk the walk. When we are disappointed, it's often because we've forgotten how we're saved, whoever we are. For there is no distinction, he says, between Jew and Greek. That is, this salvation is available to all men, and it's the same for everyone at all times, at all points in the faith walk. For the same Lord is Lord of all, he says, abounding in riches for all who, here it is, call on What he's doing here is putting the cookies on the lowest possible shelf by way of application. He's abounding in riches for all who call on him. Having talked about confessing and believing, he tells us what it looks like in the actual doing. And that is it looks like simply calling. The bottom line of which is this, when it comes to being delivered from the power of our sin and into the riches of his actual righteousness, what it means is we have not because we ask not. It's so simple. The riches of his righteousness. You know, my mother loved to tell the story of a poor immigrant who was given free passage on a ship to America back in the 19th century, which is like, back then it was like free passage to heaven. Now it's not as much heaven anymore, but still there's a lot of good here. Free passage to America, which of course was great, but what was hard for him was this. What was hard was smelling the food that they were cooking up for the paying passengers every day, day after day, in that long voyage across the Atlantic. It wasn't until the last day of the trip that the poor guy, he brought along, you know, some crackers and stuff that really didn't, really cheap stuff that didn't taste very good. But on the last day, uh, half starved, the the poor guy couldn't stand it anymore because they were cooking his favorite food, and that was fried chicken. And, of course, you could smell it all over the place uh, in the ship. And so he went to the steward, and he asked if there was any way he could just have one piece of fried chicken. Well, the steward asked him, asked to look at his ticket and he took one look at it and said well of course you can this room this ticket is for room and board it includes the food it included the food but he never asked for it until the last day of his journey are you asking of him every day of your journey His riches are available to all who call on him. All of us are poor immigrants, pilgrims, who've been given free passage to heaven that includes the food. And on every day of that passage, through every moment of that day, his riches are available on a silver platter through his word to all who just ask for them. which moves us from his stimulus to our response. Let's unpack it a bit. His word has everything we need, and the more we get to know it from the pulpit to small groups to the prayer closet as our our primary value states, it more comes into our heart and onto the tip of our tongue. And then what do we do? Again, let's read on verse 12. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They all have the same Lord who generously gives his riches to all who ask for them. That's the New Living Translation. The literal translation is uh, the New American Standard to all who call on him. And this is so important that Paul says it again in the next verse. And he doesn't just repeat it. He reinforces it deeply by quoting from God's word, from Joel 2.23, to show that it's been this way from the beginning. What I'm about to read has become one of the most famous verses in all of the Bible. So important is it. It's Romans 10, 13, our last verse for today. For anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, second time, now I'm quoting, to back myself up, shall be saved. We can't just gloss over this. 
let's focus and camp on it. All you have to do is call. All we have to do with the word that he's laid there at the door of our heart is to believe it. All we have to do with the word that he's put on the tip of our tongue is to confess it. And when the rubber meets the road, what that looks like, what that sounds like, what brings believing in your heart and confessing with your lips together is to call on the name of the Lord. Donald K. Barnhouse, the great preacher, some of you know of him, pastor and theologian who, who pastored 10th Presbyterian Church uh, in Philadelphia, uh, put it this way. He said, to call upon the name of the Lord is to believe all that the name of the Lord stands for. And to recognize that there is no strength in ourselves, but that all power dwells in him. And to commit ourselves to him in faith, desiring that he should act for us as he sees our need. So simple, but such a profound word. You see, when it comes right down to it, calling is about all we can do. All we can do is to call home for help. You say, Lord, I just took the second look at that woman. I know that's wrong. Help me. Forgive me. Help me. Lord, my thoughts are so prideful right now. Help me, Lord. Lord, there's such anger in me right now. Help me. Lord, I'm afraid to tell the truth right now. Help me. It was Peter's prayer as he was sinking into the sea as we read earlier in the service. Right then and there, at his point of greatest need, when he began to sink, as we all do in many ways, literally and metaphorically, it says he cried out saying, Lord, save me. My father called this an arrow prayer. That's what we're talking about. My father said it's a model for us all, all through life, that Peter is the very picture in simple kindergarten language of what we've been talking about today. And that is this, making live contact with him in, in utter dependence on him at the moments of our greatest need by simply calling on him. You see this all through the Bible. It's not just New Testament stuff. It permeates the Old Testament. Joel 2.23, the verse that Paul quoted, is just the tip of an iceberg. In fact, it's so important. I'll just give you one example. This is so important that by far the longest prayer in the Bible is about calling on him in this way. It's all about looking at the law, at his commandments, at his word, and saying, Lord, help me be that way. It's Psalm 119, where every verse makes mention, as many of you know, of the Word of God, and where every verse, except the first three, is a prayer about the Word of God. The whole of Psalm 119, you might say, is a gymnasium where we're trained to call on Him, that He, that God would incarnate the riches of His law and His commands and His statutes in my, our lives. And not only that, each stanza, as some of you know, of this psalm begins with a different uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. From Aleph, every line in the verse stanza begins with Aleph all the way to Sade, which is the last word, uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's, it's written this way as a memory aid, as a monomic device, because this psalm, uh, more than any of the others, more than any other place in Scripture, was written to be memorized. So important is this. As I did back in seminary, memorize the whole thing, as some of my other friends did too, as the foundation for our ministry and the rest of our lives, as some of you have too, I know. So important is this fundamental discipline of the Christian walk that 176 verses of the most uh, carefully crafted uh, psalm passage in the entire Bible, written to be memorized, teach us to call. for the simplicity of faith righteousness to free us from the tyranny 
of works righteousness. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his commandments and seek him with a whole heart. You keep by seeking. Not just by doing it yourself. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. I'm calling on you. I can't do it without you. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. I'm resolved. Oh, forsake me not utterly. I can't do it without you. I'm calling on you to do it through me. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. It's the only way I'm going to be able to take heed according to thy word. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. On and on it goes for 176 verses. That's just one example of many in the Old Testament. It's even in the Old Testament. This whole psalm teaches that you will obey the law only as you call. Is what we sang earlier in the service. Jesus, what a friend of sinners of sinners who are both saved and unsaved. Are you a sinner? You got a friend. A friend who's far better than James Taylor. <laughs> Jesus, what a friend of sinners. He, my Savior, makes me whole. Can't do it without him. Jesus, what a strength and weakness. Let me hide myself in him, because in him alone man, am I strong. Tempted, tried, and sometimes failing, he, my strength, my victory wins. And how does he, your victory, win? When you call on him. You know, down south in Houston, where Julie and I lived for 12 years, there's a man who's not very well known up here, maybe never even heard. Really, he wasn't all that well known down there, but he became one of my favorite preachers. His name is, he's passed on now, his name was Floyd Jones. He was a true Texan with his, you know, with his West Texas accent and all. An accent which Julie and I grew to love dearly in our 12 years in Houston. In fact, we picked it up and we'd get ridiculed for it when we went back home to Colorado because they've got a love-hate relationship with Texans who treat Colorado as their backyard for skiing and messing everything up. And then, so, but we didn't mind that we got ridiculed because we, lo we love the, the South. Well, Floyd Jones told a story about a time when he called on the name of the Lord and was saved from the power of sin. And today I'd like to tell it to you just like he did down to the draw because we're going to see that there's a lesson even in the unpretentious accent. As he put it, he, he heard a knock on the door, and there was his neighbor. His veins were distended in his neck, and his mouth was wide open, shouting at him. It was open so wide that I could hardly see my neighbor's eyeballs, he said. Because my dog had dug up his favorite shrub. You know how it is. It's never just an ordinary crummy old shrub that your dog digs up. Oh, no. It was the one his grandma sent from Australia. Now, what am I going to do? I could say I'd like to punch him in the nose. But I'm hanging on for dear life. Christians are wise, and it would not be wise to punch him in the nose. But all that kind of thinking is in the flesh, he said, if that's all you do. So what do you do? Well, you look at those veins in your neighbor's neck, and you just start praying. Lord, thank you. Thank you. I used to be just like that. Thank you, Lord. I, you've changed my life, and I'm not like that anymore. Glory to God. 
and, and, and thank you that he's not hit me yet. And thank you that I'm not like that because you're the real me and you're in me and you're living in me and you're available to me whenever I call on you. Now, now, go to it, Lord. <laughs> and suddenly, my neighbor, he says, begins to feel a little ashamed because he hears me, he hears me say, I, I'm sorry my dog's done that. I apologize. Now you listen, you just go to any nursery you want. Now, I, I, I know, I know, I can't possibly replace in any way that special shrub that your grandma sent from Australia. But you go, and you buy any what you want, and I'll pay the bill. In fact, when you get back, it pleasure me to help you plant it. And I'll try to do better in the future and keep my dog in my own yard. I'm so sorry. And you know something? He said, my neighbor and me, we're friends now. You see, it's even for me. It's for everybody, whether you're Jew or Greek, whether you're an ignorant seeker or a lifelong follower of Christ. There, this ain't no sophisticated theology that's just for the professor types. down-home doctrine for regular folks like you and me that if you just call on the name of the Lord you shall be saved whether you're in the God forsaken plains of West Texas you know or in the beautiful green mountains of Vermont which we have also grown so deeply to love that's what Paul meant when he said the life that I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God. Floyd Jones was saying what all of us said, what all of us sang earlier in the service. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus. Trusting only thee. Trusting thee for full salvation. Great and free. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, never let me fall. I am trusting thee forever and for all. It's what John Wesley said. He said, every command in the Bible is covered by a promise. This is Psalm 119. There is the closest connection between the law and the gospel. The law requires us to love God, to love our neighbor, to be meek, humble, and holy. We feel we are not sufficient for these things, yea, that with man this is impossible. But we hear the good news of the gospel, the promise of God to give us that love and humility and meekness and holiness. And we lay hold of this gospel as we call upon him, and behold, it is done unto us according to our faith. One of the most important things to remember in the Christian life is so very simple. And in the Gospels, he's given us the very picture of it, the picture of that pattern, so we don't forget it when Peter said, Lord, save me, arrow prayers. Whatever you do, don't forget to call. Winter, spring, summer, or fall, all you got to do is call, and he'll be there. You might not feel it right away, but if over the course of a lifetime you put that into practice, it makes all the difference in the world. Especially if you're in a church which through the word of God is a greenhouse for growth. You've come to the right place. Yeah, sometimes You'll call for help until you feel like you're blue in the face. But if you persist, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep asking, as Christ taught. He will come through in his time and in his way. Because though we never know exactly how or when it will happen, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Reminds me of another song, one some of you I'm sure have heard, that Nicole C. Mullen sings, is titled, Call on Jesus. 
I'm so very ordinary, nothing special on my own. Oh, I have never walked on water and I've never calmed a storm. Sometimes I'm hiding away from the madness around me like a child who's afraid of the dark. But when I call on Jesus, all things are possible. I can mount on wings like eagles and soar. When I call on Jesus, mountains are going to fall because he'll move heaven and earth to come rescue me when I call. Then she addresses each of us in our need. Weary brother, broken daughter, widowed, widowed lover. If you're tired and scared of the madness around you, if you can't find the strength to carry on, when you call on Jesus, all things are possible. All things come by faith, from first to last, starting with the most important things with the greatest of riches, calling on him for your justification and for your sanctification, calling on him for righteousness imputed and for righteousness imparted, calling on him to be saved from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin, calling on him to be delivered from the tyranny of works righteousness for the simplicity of faith righteousness. To obtain it all, all you've got to do is call.